Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate being asked to come and speak today. Um, I took a look at some of the past speakers. I don't know how many of them you've come to, uh, to this series. It's, it's quite an impressive list. There are a lot of uh, well-known companies, uh, high-powered companies, uh, influential people. Um, if you take a look at them and hear from them, you probably get a vision of what success looks like for those companies and those people. Um, it almost makes me wonder why I've been asked uh, to speak here, and I think perhaps it's maybe to share a different perspective on a different kind of success, because I think the important thing to understand is you can define success any way you want, and it's not always the same as somebody else. So I think the important thing is to take a stock on what success looks like for you. Um, just a couple weeks ago, in this same building, I came up to um, a lecture series from a gentleman who wrote the book From Success to Significance. Uh, his name is Lloyd Reber, um, or Lloyd Reeb. And uh, he's with a, with a Halftime Institute. And that's, a, that's an organization or a movement that is for people in business who basically say, what's next? And it's generally for people at age 45 where they say, what's, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And as population uh, gets, uh, uh, gets older, we don't retire as early as we can. For a lot of people, that's literally the halftime of their career. And that organization helps people to understand how they can take their success and move it into giving significance um, in a different way. And as I'm listening to that conversation, I started to think back about my life. And for me, actually, I was in my mid-20s, late 20s when I started to have those questions. And I said, what if? You know, what if I used the gifts that I've been given? And what if I, in later years, what if I used the business that I started as a platform to serve others and change people's lives. So I felt like I've been through my halftime much earlier in my life, and it's because I define success in a slightly different way than other business people. So I'll start out, uh, just a quick thing about me. I graduated from art school 35 years ago. I, I went and have a degree or a certificate in graphic design. I co-founded an ad agency in Lancaster 27 years ago, and for the past 21 years, I've been the sole owner. I co-founded with a partner, I bought him out midway through, and since then I've been a uh, sole owner of that company. A little bit about Sheffy. We're a marketing communications firm. You know, years ago, we, it was called an advertising agency, an ad agency, or a full service ad agency. Later on, it was called Integrated Marketing, but we are a marketing communications firm. And I like to say that we improve clients' bottom lines and people's lives. And the reason I separate those two is because we have clients in two distinctly different segments. We have most of our clients are what we would call for-profit corporations. And when you are working for for-profit corporations, they care about one thing helping them achieve greater profits. So we help bring leads to them, we help them increase sales and revenue, and the, ultimately they want to increase their profits. So it's a very bottom line financial metric, and that's what we do for them. But we also do a lot of work for nonprofit organizations. And when you are working in the nonprofit sector, it's less about the bottom line and it's more about achieving, helping them achieve their mission for stakeholders and for the community, for whatever service that they're in. So our business is really focusing in those two segments. That's part of my what if. I'm able to use the business as a platform to work with nonprofit um, organizations. Our services in our firm, I don't know how familiar you may be with uh, ad agencies or marketing firms, but those are the different types of services that we do. Um, we start with marketing strategy. That's what we call the thinking before the doing. There are a lot of design firms and ad agencies that quickly jump into creating ads, creating brochures and things like that. A lot of what we do is marketing strategy and the reason we do that is because our clients expect a return on investment. So we have to understand what success looks like for them and then we have to help them achieve that success. We do media, we buy media, whether that's ads, billboards, radio, TV, commercials, uh, 
um, or digital marketing now. Uh, we do creative. We have people who are creative. My background is creative. That's the copywriting and the design aspect of what we do. Digital marketing, as you can expect, is really the fastest growing part of any marketing firm or agency because that's where you live, that's where most people live. They live on the internet and they really, that's where they go for information to make, to make decisions and make purchases. So that's content marketing, social media, email marketing, search engine optimization, pay-per-click or Google AdWords, however you want to call that. The digital space for a, for a marketing firm like ours is really growing uh, quite rapidly. We develop a lot of websites for clients and not, not only do we develop them, but we manage them um, on an ongoing basis. And then we do public relations um, as well. Um, a differentiator um, is, you, is how we take the different people with their backgrounds and put them into one organization to help create some synergy. I thought it might be uh, interesting just to kind of share with you, these are the degrees that people had before they found themselves coming to our company. The first few bullet points are obviously you would expect advertising, marketing, communication. We had an English major who's now a digital marketing uh, person. Uh, the computer science is, is our lead developer. He, he went for computer science with visual um, uh, as the focus. You might wonder why is there an interior designer? People, they, they change careers. Uh, this interior designer is uber organized and is on top of every attention to detail. And she's now uh, a client service coordinator. So she's just an, a wonderful asset on our team. Uh, we do have two people with business administration backgrounds. One happens to be our operations director. Um, but there are people in business that find their ways to, uh, to a marketing firm. Uh, the last one, psychology, is interesting. We have a person with a minor in psychology. Um, coincidentally, uh, years back, a lot of my friends whose children were in high school, they'd come to me and they'd say, hey, my child wants to go to uh, marketing school or go to college for marketing or communications or even graphic design. Would you talk to them? Just tell them what it's like. Every time I talk to anybody from a designer through any kind of communication world, I tell them, take psychology courses, take as much psychology as you can because that's the world of marketing. You know, it's really about the science of behavior and the mind and that's what we do as marketers. So uh, people are often surprised when I tell them that, but I think if you've got a psychology background, a uh, minor, even a major, or just as many courses as you can, I don't think that's just about marketing. I think regardless, whatever industry you will go into, Having an understanding of human behavior, what, how they think, how they act, is going to be critical because you're in a very relational uh, world right now and you have to work with people. And I think the more you can understand that, um, the better it will be. For me, the value that I bring to the team, I'm a creative thinker. Um, and you might say, well, you went to design school, of course you're a creative thinker, but it goes way past design. I've, since I was little, I thought differently I, I, than other people. I asked questions that other people didn't think to ask. I looked at situations a little bit differently. Um, and it really helped me in my career. And I also use, encourage others, everybody has creativity. They may say, well, I can't draw, or I can't do this, or I can't do that. But we're, everybody is a creative thinker to one extent or the other. Thinking creatively and is essential component of being successful in life because you, you just can't think like everybody else. It's when you can think differently, look at the same problem from a different perspective. Um, that's what I do and then I really lead that in our firm um, to be able to think differently. We, in my generation, we call that the right brain. I don't know if, they st if you still talk about left brain, right brain, but I'm a creative thinker which makes me right brained. But I've also was wired to understand business principles. And that, that was unusual to have a strong left brain and a strong right brain. So what that means is I can sit with a business owner in any industry and he, can, he or she can tell me their complex issues and I can break them down into simplified concepts. I can understand them quickly. I can then develop marketing strategies to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve in their business. And then I can work with our team 
to make sure that we align anything that we do with their business goals um, and their sales processes. So to be able to, to think creatively but also understand complex issues, that's the value um, that I have on our team. The last part is principled leadership. Um, one of the things that I know people are attracted to our business and the reason people stay in our business is because they feel comfortable, they feel safe, they, they appreciate the moral compass that I have in how I lead the business. Um, and that's an important thing to have is uh, regardless of what you do is to be a principled person um, will, will help you go a long way. It doesn't take long to look at the news today and see what happens when you're not a principled uh, person. So I, I would say that's to have the right moral compass um, is important regardless of what business uh, you are in. To talk a little bit about the marketing and communications business, um, I love what I do. And the reason I love what I do is because we get to know a little bit about a lot of different things. So, for instance, if you get a job in whatever company that may be, you're going to be expected to go very deep in your knowledge about that business and about that industry. Your, your days are going to be consumed about that business and industry. And that's great. A lot of people love to do that. People who work in marketing firms like mine, what really excites us is we work across a lot of different businesses and industries. We don't have to learn as much as the clients that we do work for, but we still have to know a little bit. Uh, you know, as an example, yesterday I was working on banking, recreational and athletic surfacing, healthcare, steel fabrication, tourism, and even trash and recycling. And uh, it, I love that part. And it's funny because some we have some clients where people say, oh, that's a boring industry. I'm fascinated by any industry. If you look at any industry, any company, you can find what makes that fascinating. For me, even trash and recycling can be fascinating. But I love the fact that we get to work in so many different businesses and industries. We create. I mean, th what I love is to be able at the end of the day to step back and see what we created. A lot of businesses can let you do that, but sometimes there are people who just say, I'm so busy, but I just don't, I don't feel like I'm accomplishing anything. Find out what you can do where you can create. And it doesn't have to be design and things, but that gives a self-satisfaction from a day-to-day -day basis that might help you sustain those long hauls when it's just kind of a grind to get through. We love because we, we create. We influence people's perception. We do that through branding and through storytelling. Marketing is about storytelling. That's all we do. Um, and we love to be able to create stories, tell those stories, and see how we're influencing people's perceptions. That's the cool part about marketing. And then the last part, uh, what I love, is we get to compel people to take action. That's the psychology. That's where if you've got a, a psychology understanding, you, there's a strategy, it's really cool to know that what we created got somebody interested, they paid some attention, and then we actually got them to do what we wanted them to do. It's not manipulation, it's just guiding them through. But that's the part that I really love about what we do. So I wanted, I titled uh, today's talk, Learning, Leading, Influencing, Impacting. And what I really want you to do is to understand how important it is to learn before you lead, the difference between leading and influencing, and I will talk about that a little bit, and ultimately how important impacting is. You know, people want to be a leader, but they don't understand what leading uh, feels like. And I, so what I want to do is I'm just going to take you through my, the timeline of my professional career, but don't worry, I hope you're not too bored, because I'm going to tell a few stories around the different timeline periods, just to kind of give you an idea of what it means to go through in a business cycle. As I said, I graduated from art school. I did that uh, when I was 20 years old, uh, back in 82, and I quickly joined an agency. Um, I worked for four advertising agencies um, in the first eight years of my career. It wasn't because I was uh, dissatisfied or just unsettled. Um, I was fortunate that I had my first job before I even graduated, and then I got recruited by an agency, recruited by an agency, recruited by an agency. So I was very fortunate.
But I took the best advantage uh, of that. I learned a lot with each experience, and each company gave me a little bit different experience to learn from. I worked very hard. I kept my mouth shut. I proved my value, but I also took nuggets from each of those experiences to begin forming my ideas because I, I knew I was always going to be a business owner. I just didn't know when. So I would say take advantage of those experiences that you have. And for me, it happened very quickly. I, I only worked in, in the business for others for eight years. Um, before, in, uh, eight years later, in 1990, I co-founded um, an ad agency um, with another partner. Um, we did this in 1990. Um, we, we started our business during a recession, and not only a recession, but it was literally at the start. We were moving our things into this, this rented space during Operation Desert Shield, which um, in 1990 was actually the first combat uh, um, assignment for the United States in the Middle East. So we were starting a business during a recession, and during a war, and people thought we were nuts. And we, keep telling, we kept telling everybody, well, if we can make it during the recession and a war, we can be pretty successful uh, moving ahead. So starting a business during a lot of painful economic times and uncertainty about the world um, may not be the wisest decision. Um, and if I had thought about it too much, I mean, I was only 29 years old. My partner was 44. He had a lot more wisdom. If I'd have thought about it too much, I probably wouldn't have done it. But we were committed, and I said, we, let, let's, let's jump off the cliff, but let's figure it out as we go along. So uh, it, was, it was a lot of uh, quick learning um, in, that, in that regard. Six years later, um, I forced um, my partner out of the business. Uh, I purchased his half of the business and he left. Um, we were 15 years apart and his, uh, I, I agreed to join business with him because he was older and wiser. So it was a learning experience for me. I learned a lot as a young, a young person. Um, one of the things I learned was he wanted to go that way and I wanted to go that way. He was very happy, happy being small. There were three, just three people after six years and he didn't want to grow because he was looking at the end of his career and I'm young, I wanted to keep going. Um, and I realized when you're in a 50-50 partnership, if you don't agree, you're not going to get, you're just not going to do anything. And that, that's, a, that's a challenge as you're looking at 50-50 partnerships, if that's something that you're going to get into. You'd better get into it with somebody that you have a like mind um, because it was, it was tough for us. But at age 35, I, I borrowed $100,000 from the bank, I paid him off, he left the business, and now all of a sudden, every decision is my decision. Whatever I want to do, we're going to do. Um, one of the things you have to understand is when you own a business, um, you don't turn it off at 5 o'clock. It, you, you never stop thinking about your business. Um, it, it, you become consumed by it. You know, you, you, every evening when you're sleeping, every weekend, it's just hard not to think about your business when you own a business. And in my case, not long after buying out my partner and I was the sole owner, we once again hit some, some bumpy times. Um, late 1990, I don't know if anybody, does anybody know what Y2K is? You, do you remember the, it's the, uh, it's the Millennium Computer Bug. Back in the late 90s, Every business was worried, what's going to happen when my computer clicks the calendar from 1999 to 2000? January 1st, 2000, believe me, those of us who remember, it was all doom and gloom. Computers were going to blow up. All of your data was going to be lost. We had clients who, they, they weren't sure what was going to happen literally when they woke up on January 1st. Now, so just imagine, we have clients who pay us a lot of money to invest in the future. We're, they're giving us money to pay for marketing to help their business down the road. They didn't know what the future looked like. They were very worried. And toward the end of 1999, things slowed down because pe businesses just didn't know what was going to happen. But as, as we all know, 2000, the, the calendar clicked and the computers didn't crash and data wasn't lost. So we, we kind of breathed a sigh of relief. 2001, another recession. 
This one was another painful recession, just like the 1990 uh, recession. Um, and when you own a business, you don't just think about yourself anymore. You think about your employees and your employees' families. You really start to worry not just about yourself but, you know, or your business, but what happens if the business doesn't survive? It's not, it's not just, well, I'll go find another job. What's going to happen to those people that I employ and their families? You really start to think a whole lot differently when you own a business. Um, and then, as we were going through the recession, 9-11 um, hits, September 11th, 2001. If you were in business, I, I can tell you, the world froze. I mean, literally, people froze. Businesses stopped. Everything came to a point where we said, what in the world is happening? What's going to happen? And again, for a business like ours, we rely on investment spending, investing in the future. We had clients that said, oh my gosh, if, if we're going to be thrust into a war, the stock market is going to crash. If the stock market's going to crash, the value of my business is going to go down. Nobody's going to buy my product or service. Should I be spending money on marketing? So you can see, for, for a young person who is now so, sole owner of a business, Economic things, things that happen around the world, things that happen around the United States have a ripple effect, and you have to think about that ripple effect. But we did get through it. Um, we got through those things. Um, business was strong. In 2004, my wife and I made a big uh, investment. Uh, we bought a commercial building, an old tobacco warehouse in downtown Lancaster. At that point, our agency was back up to nine people, so we were starting to grow. We had a lot of clients. Things looked great. Um, my wife and I made a $900,000 investment in buying and fixing up that building. And, and let me tell you something, as for a small business, for, from, for, for my wife and I, that's a sobering experience now. We started the business with no debt. We didn't pay ourselves for a few months, but we didn't have any debt. I took out some debt to buy out my partner, but now all of a sudden, that kind of investment is a sobering, sobering experience. But I had plans for a much bigger agency, so I was willing to make that leap of faith. And at that time, business was going great. Our clients wanted more and more from us, and we couldn't find people to hire fast enough. So I had in my mind, why don't I go out and start acquiring some businesses? So here I am, sole owner, and I said, well, I'm going to acquire a small design firm. And now, so that we have designers who uh, who can do all the design work that we need because I couldn't hire the right people fast enough. And, and at the same time, I hired a small internet firm. We're doing so many websites, we can't keep up with the volume. I'm just acquiring people and businesses and putting them onto our team. Um, and all of a sudden, within a six-month period, we went from nine people uh, to 15 people. Um, here I am a creative person and I'm running a business that's growing. I have a lot of debt. I have a lot of infrastructure. I didn't know what I was doing. Again, I, I just leapt and I thought I'd figure it out as I go along. So one of the smartest things I ever did is I hired a business consultant. I said, okay, you know me, help me out here. We hired an operations administrator. I got back to doing what I could do well. He focused on the operations, the HR, the finance, managing the building. He did all the things that I didn't like to do. We, we established a leadership team so I could start pulling people in and, and talking with them and asking their opinions. Um, 2017, I called the pinnacle of our growth. We were at 20 people. So the end of 2004, we were at nine people. By the beginning of 2007, we were at 20 people and it was out of control. So what I had worked over a few years to build as far as a cohesive team at, at nine people, all of a sudden I thrust a new company into the team and then a second company. We got out of whack. Our cultures were different. The clients felt different. Um, we had 20 people on two floors and there were days that went by I didn't even talk to some of these people. And I, and I will say I was def definitely um, out of control. And my wife asked me the obvious question one night, and it really was a wake-up call. She said, why are you doing this? You're not, you're not happy. You come home at night exhausted. You don't want to talk because you're tired and you're moody. Um, you, 
obviously don't love what you're doing. You're distracted. You're working too much. Why are you doing this? Um, for me, I had, to, I had to admit, my idea of success started to change, and it was, how big can I get? How big can this business get? How, how big can our revenue get? How many clients can we get? And it was a big wake-up call, and it helped me to realize bigger is not better. For me, at least for me, it wasn't. There are some people who are doing a great job with large companies, but for me and for my life purpose, bigger wasn't better. Culture, to me, mattered a whole lot more. The relationship that I had with people and the relationship that our team had, um, it was profit over revenue. And that was a lesson, not being a business major uh, or a business person, I should say, at all, I just kept saying, well, let's get more higher revenue, higher revenue. When we were small, we had tremendous profits. The bigger we got, the harder it was to keep those profits to the point where you know, there were years where we were breaking even or maybe even losing a little bit of money. And I realized getting bigger isn't better. Keeping your profit good and keeping your culture intact, that was, that was even better. And for me, Impacting our community was a part of my DNA. I cared about others. I cared about the community. And I was so busy feeding this machine of our business more, more clients and more projects. I just got totally um, out of whack. And it was because I lost sight of why I started a business in the first place and what mattered to me most um, as a person. So in 2008, um, I did what I called a vision and culture correction. After talking with my wife, who was not in the business, but for any business owner, your spouse is a, is a tremendous asset to you in thinking, helping you think clearly, um, we decided we were going to go through a vision and culture correction. Um, we released a lot of clients. I mean, we literally had a lot of clients that we just, they, they gave us a lot of money, but we, we released them. Most of those clients were from those two small firms that we acquired because they didn't see us as a, a, a trusted partner. They just saw us as a vendor. And we just didn't feel connected with those businesses. So we released a lot of clients. We had to release some of, the, some of our staff because we couldn't support them financially. But more importantly, they weren't fitting within the culture or the new vision that I had. Um, so over a year's time, we went from 20 people and a lot of clients to 12 people. And I felt really good at that time that we kind of recalibrated and got the business back to where it was where I wanted it to be to serve the vision um, that I had. So we felt pretty good uh, at 2008 uh, about where the business was. Whoop. Whoop. Um, then the Great Recession hit. And if you're, if you're counting, this is now the third recession in the life of our business. Um, this one was painful, as you all know. You, you're, you've lived through it. Now, now imagine you own a business and you have employees and you have clients and you have bank debt. Um, and the fact that this recession was by far the, the most painful, deepest, uh, most far-reaching recession that, that and our, all of our generations know, we, you know the depression was different. But for us, this was tough. Um, this really hit our agency because, again, we have clients who now are in a free fall. They're in a panic mode. Do you think they're going to keep spending money on advertising and marketing? Or are they going to keep those people who they have emotional connections with on their team? I mean, they were in survival mode. They were slashing the budgets. Marketing was the first thing to go for many, many businesses. So all of a sudden, we see our revenue just drop way down. It was tough. Um, I will tell you, that was very painful. It's where a person's true stripes are revealed. And I think the one thing now that I can look at learn, uh, looking back, um, you saw people's true stripes. And that's, that's an important aspect in business, to be able to look at a person and know who they really are. Things that are important to me, like ethics, integrity, empathy, I started to see them being overlooked by people or totally ignored by people because they were in a panic mode. And when you're in survival, you do whatever you have to do. Um, for me, I was very, very fortunate. 
Um, I'm one of, there are four men that for a long time we've been f a four per men accountability group. We're, we're, we're men of faith. We're all driven by our faith. Uh, we're devoted fa uh, husbands and fathers. And we're uh, business owners. And we've been together for a long time. And when you have a relationship like I had with them, you can be totally transparent. They, they know me as well as I know myself. We hold each other accountable. We, you, know, you just you, you can't you can't tell them things that aren't true because they just know it and they're going to hold you to account. Um, that was that was huge for me, and I, I would encourage, and I do. I I mentor a lot of twenty-somethings uh, men who are on leadership tracks, and I tell them find some guys that you can connect with, that you can be transparent with, be vulnerable with. I I. I'm sorry, but I think it's easier for women to do that. I don't want to stereotype, but I know it's a challenge for men because I talk to enough men, and it's it's so important for men to do that. And it, you might think it's a, it's weird or it's it's weak. It it's not. It's it's you need to have that. Men need to have men, and you got to have men with the same moral compass as you, because otherwise you're going to drift. But I would encourage you, and for me, it 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 worked so well. We stayed together um, through that very hard because I said, don't let me change. And we all said that. We all committed to not letting that happen during the recession. I became very transparent with our team. I sat down and told them the hard facts. This is the way it is. And I think being transparent and being vulnerable as a leader, good times and bad, is important. Don't hide things because people are smarter than you give them credit for. Um, so I would say be transparent. I was certainly transparent. We were slightly over leveraged. Uh, we, had, we had a lot of debt with the bank. Um, the problem was our bank during the recession got put on the Fed watch. They had to go start collecting all the cash they could. Thankfully, they didn't call our mortgage, which was huge, but they did call our line of credit. They, and they, they required us to pay all the money that we owed them on our business loan back immediately because they needed the cash. That puts a lot of businesses out of, out of business, but for my wife and I, we sold some of our real estate. We moved into a small condo. Um, we, we just shrunk, we shrunk things. We simplified our lives. Um, you know, we chose to do that for the business. I chose to do it for the people that, that were on the team. Um, I saw a number of business owners during the recession refuse to change their lifestyle and some of them aren't in business anymore, and some of them are just a fraction of what they used to be. They refused to change what they thought they were entitled to, which was a lavish lifestyle based on the success of their business. I had a long haul view, and I said, I want this business to survive, not only for me and my family, but for the people that are on our team. So I did all the things that, I, that we needed to do as a business um, to survive, and I think that's one reason why we're here today. Um, we laid off two team members. We had to. We had no choice. And in fact, my wife, who's not part of the business, she worked in the business for a year and a half with no pay. Fortunately, she did not have a paying job outside of the home, so she could do that. But that, that gives you an idea of what it means to be fully committed to your business. My wife worked for a year and a half um, without any pay. Um, but again, I watched other agencies refuse to change, and, and it impacted them. Um, we did get through it. It was, it was, it was tough. Um, and I will say it was tough on me emotionally and physically because, again, if you're committed to survive, you'll do whatever it takes um, to survive, which I simplified my life. I sacrificed, but I kept doing it for others. If I only cared about myself, it would have been easy to say to the bank, fine, I can't pay you back that money. I could have closed the business walked away, stuck the bank with all that business, and probably started all over, but I was not going to do that to the whole team. So um, when you have that long haul view, you, you tend to make some different decisions. And I think that's where people's stripes are really revealed. So then we get back to the, uh, back to the long haul. We, after, the, after we realized we made it through the recession, we recalibrated some things. At that point, I was tired. I was the sole owner. And I was making all the decisions. I had a leadership team, but it was ultimately still responsible to me. I took my operations guy, and I made him my co-pilot. Um, you know, 
here's a guy that I've already talked to him about buying into the business at some point, but I just was tired and I needed help. And there's nothing wrong with a business leader saying, I need help. I need help because I don't know something, or I need help because I'm tired. I need help because you're better at it than I am. He knows how to run the business. I know how to, to think creatively and, and do marketing. So for me, it was great to pull him in even closer to be my co-pilot. Um, last year, business was great. We were, making, uh, we were seeing a lot of growth. We made a very large capital and human investment in our business. Um, and uh, we, we were looking out 10 years, and I wanted to, I wanted to capitalize things to give us the, the capability to do that. Wham, at the end of last year, we lose two large clients. One was of no fault to, to ours, the other was a shared responsibility, but all of a sudden our, our, our business dropped again. It required more recalibrating. That's the life of a business. You know, it's, it's hard to put a business on autopilot. And I will tell you, back in the, in the 90s um, and parts of 2000, our, our business could be on co-pilot. It was very successful. I didn't have to work as hard about it. But between recessions, between things out of your control, you just got to pay attention when you're in a leadership position of a business or own a business. And it hit us again. We, we've spent this past year trying to make up a very large financial deficit. And I can say we're hitting the end of the year. We have done that. We've picked up enough business to do that. But it, it was hard. It's just tiring. But it's the reality of owning a business today. You just have to do that. So for me, um, I look at now the, the future and for me the final, the final act. So I've been talking with two people in our company for about five years about buying, buying the business for me. But it's all been talks. So 2018, I'm committed to formalizing my succession plan from thinking to an actionable plan. And that's an important thing to do if you own a business. You've got to have that. Quite frankly, I should have had this years ago because some businesses can sell quickly and that's great. But for the most part, you, you really got to, um, you got to look at a multi-year um, plan. So my plan is for 2018 to, to, to put everything into action and, num and num 2019 actually start selling pieces of the business a little at a time. Um, to those two people, we actually need a third person. So we're trying to find a third person to put in place. But it's a multi-year. I'm looking at s selling the business over six years. Um, I learned a valuable lesson from my father who owned a business. Um, he, re he sold the business and retired all at the same time and walked away. And he had a payout over many years, but he was not in the business to affect it. And two or three years into that business, the, the new owners just really dropped the ball. And uh, the, the business is no longer. And he got stuck with a lot of money. And I said to myself, I'm not leaving until I have all of my money. And for me, the business value is my retirement. Um, it's what's going to make me live comfortably um, and securely. I'm not leaving until I have all of my money, so, which is why we're talking about an, a six-year buyout over a, a longer period of time. Once I'm paid off, we're going to have a big party for me, and I'm going to leave. Um, but for me, I want to make sure that I'm able to influence and impact the business while I'm relying on that money coming back to me. I want to talk a little bit about what I call life disruptors. You know, my life and as the business owner, the business have been defined by a lot of life disruptors. And you're going to have the same thing. You may have already had them in your life. And I think it's important for you to understand what life disruptors can do. And I'll just quickly go through. For me, parenthood. My wife and I had our two children before I even started the business. Um, you talk about how you know, your, your outlook and your priorities change when you have children. And for me, it's, a, it's having a serious others-focused mindset. When you're a parent, you're thinking about your children. When you own a business, you need to be thinking about your employees. I actually think being a parent gave me tremendous uh, training for owning a business. Starting a business, uh, obviously a, a life disruptor. For, for my family, I didn't take a paycheck for, for almost four months. My partner and I were committed not to borrow money to start a business, so we just didn't pay ourselves. That, Talk about a life disruptor. That, that disrupts your family. You know, fortunately, I had a, you know, we were in a good position. My wife was understanding and believed in me. Um, but that's definitely a life disruptor. Um, Down syndrome. When my son was four or five, um, 
there was a, a little boy at our church who had Down syndrome. And it was beautiful to see how my young son interacted with this, this child with Down syndrome. He didn't see him as having a problem. He just, he just saw him as being different than others. And he actually embraced that. And they formed a, a, a relationship they actually still have today. It's, a, it's just a beautiful relationship. And as a young person, I looked at that and I felt so good about humanity. And then I looked at older people and adults and I saw how, how they treat people with, with differences. And that was disheartening for me. And that really, for me, started my uh, commitment to using my time and talents for equitable treatment. I joined boards. I joined that child's, the board. I just joined boards. I joined movements. I said, how can I use my gifts, my assets, how can I use the business as a platform to fight for equitable, equitable treatment? Um, and that was really the start. The Great Recession, again, I, as I said, uh, pain puts things into perspective. The Great Recession put a lot of things into perspective. You're going to have your Great Recession. You're going to have whatever you call it. You're going to have painful life disruptions. And let me tell you, pain marks you for life. You get to choose whether that mark is for good or for bad. But you're going to be marked. So be mindful of that and make decisions. What are you going to do with those pain uh, moments, those life disruptions? Um, World Vision is another organization that I got to know through our church. Um, we fell in love. Uh, actually, our hearts were broken first on what was happening in Africa with children, with orphans. Uh, we just fell in love with those kids, and we've been adopting kids ever since. Um, and it, again, it brought me back to equitable treatment. Now, all of a sudden, these are kids that I'll never see. I don't know them, but I still have a heart. And I've used our business um, as a platform for that. One of the things that helped me do is, besides discipline, benevolence for my wife and I in our giving, um, I moved that into our business. You know, up to that point, every end of every year, we always sent our clients holiday gifts. It was, you know, water bottles with our logo on it. It was shirts. It was blankets. It was just stuff. We made the decision, we are going to use the profits of our business to impact other people's lives. And every year, and we still do it today, we choose an, an, a movement, an organization, um, whatever you want to call it, and we give a, a very nice gift to that organization. Then we communicate to our clients what we're doing. We express gratitude for, to them for helping us be able to do that through the work they give us. But we send letters to these organizations listing all of the clients. Our clients love it. They don't need more pens and paper and water bottles. But we actually are using our business as part of our benevolence on serving others. Cancer, for me, about seven years ago, I lost a brother-in-law to cancer. I lost two very dear friends to cancer. My, I have a brother who is still on his cancer journey. Cancer was all around me and our family and people that I loved. Um, we were presented with an, an interesting opportunity. The Lancaster General Health uh, uh, Hospital was, uh, came to us. They were a client. They are in plans to build a cancer institute in Lancaster. And this thing was going to be an amazing um, uh, venture for them. And they wanted us to help them raise money. So we jumped into that capital campaign with our heart and soul. And it's amazing. All of a sudden, others on our team, I started to hear their cancer stories about their families and friends. But cancer was a was a life disruptor for me personally, and I chose to use the business and the gifts that I have, both gifts uh, internal and gifts assets. We're still pouring a lot of our time um, and efforts into celebrating now the, the AMB Barshinger Cancer, Cancer Institute in Lancaster. And I keep telling people, I, I hope I never have to go there for treatment, but it's, it's, it's a good feeling to know it's there, and it's a good feeling to know that I was a part, and our firm was a part of bringing that to Lancaster. Um, grandchildren is another life disruptor that you'll have, hopefully you'll have someday if you're blessed with that, and for us, we have two grandkids, and again, it's others focus, but it, it really, I'm thinking about them when they're 10, 20, 30, well before, long after I'm gone. As a, as a leader, you're always needing the vision out to the future. You need to be looking to the future. And I realize I'm doing the same thing with grandkids now. 
Um, and more recently, uh, autism. Our oldest son, our grandson, Jeremiah, who's five, um, is, uh, was diagnosed about a year and a half ago with high-functioning autism. Um, I was already wired to think that way. I don't think it's a problem. I actually think it's, it's Jeremiah's gift. That's his gift. We, that's how we see it. And while my wife has poured her life into what she can do to help Jeremiah, I'm doing the same, but I'm already thinking, what can I do with my influence to help impact not only Jeremiah's life, but other children's lives with autism? And how can I change people's perceptions about autism? It's not something that you want to hide from. It's something that you should embrace and understand diversity. So for me, autism is my most recent life disruptor, and it's something that I really want to embrace and get, get around. I want to talk uh, just real quickly about some books that have influenced my thinking. I know you do a lot of reading in, in college, both uh, books and e-books and things, uh, and I hope people have told you your learning isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to stop. Uh, in fact, your learning should accelerate um, when you're uh, in your careers. For me, some, some significant things that I was exposed to uh, early on was E-Myth Revisited. It's a book by Michael Garber. Um, I actually had, um, excuse me a sec, um, I actually had the, uh, the, the, the privilege of meeting him. He spoke at a conference that I was at and I read his book. One of the things that helped me to understand, this book is about the idea that here I am, a designer, and I say, hey, I'm going to start a business. I wake up the next day and I'm a, I'm a business owner. I wasn't trained to be a business owner. I was trained to be a designer. And I love being a designer. What happens if I don't love being a business owner? So for any of you who have in your, in your mind to be a business owner, think about that. Why do you want to be a business owner? If you love doing what you do, are you going to love being a business owner when you're not really equipped yet perhaps to do that. Um, he taught me through his book and through his lecture to work on the business just like you work in the business. So in marketing, I work with clients on working in the business, but I have to remember to work on the business, on ours. That was a great influence for me. Um, also, Purpose Driven Life uh, by Rick Warren. Um, that's a, a faith book. My wife and I went through that. Our church uh, did the video. We met, we met Rick Warren. We went through the book. Um, our life group went through that whole series. For me personally, as a believer, it helped me to say, and what I'm reflecting, is that what God intended for me? And I'm not here to preach faith, because the same thing can apply to anybody. Is what you're doing and what you're reflecting, what other people are seeing you doing, and is that really the purpose that you want to do for your life? For us, it was, it was life-changing. Uh, we started shedding material things. At that point in our lives, we were both driving brand new BMWs. We were going on great vacations with our families. We were, we were kind of moving into that material world, and it really helped me re-ground myself in disciplined benevolence. So we shed a lot of that, um, and we put a lot of our uh, talents and assets into serving others. Uh, the Four Obsessions of an Extraordinary Executive by Patrick Lencioni. If, if you're in business, have you heard of, of Patrick Lencioni? Any book you can read, any blog you can watch, any, anything you can absorb from Patrick Lencioni in the business world is invaluable. And I would encourage you to try to find that. Um, this was just one of the books that really hit me about how to be a better leader, um, a lot about organizational clarity and communication skills, but that was just a really powerful book. Strengths Finder, actually, it's a book. I didn't read the book, but we watched the video. Marcus Buckingham, tremendous thing that changed my outlook on collaboration. It helped me to look differently at our team. And we actually went through almost a year's process of looking at what each person's strengths are. And I want to tell you, a strength is not what you're good at. A strength is what energizes you after you've done it. You know, there are a lot of people who are good at something, so they say, well, then you go do it because you're good at it, and they don't want to do it. They're not happy doing it. They're not energized. And if you're not energized, you're not going to put your heart and soul into that. And this video and this whole Strengths Finder program helped us to understand each person's strengths and then how do those strengths align 
with us as a team. I'll tell you, one person on our team, he realized he wasn't, he wasn't doing what he loved to do. Unfortunately, and we helped him to understand what it is he loved doing, we, didn't, we couldn't offer that, and he left. But I'll tell you, I, I never felt so good about a person leaving um, than, he, than that situation, because I knew he was moving to a place where he was going to feel really good. We also had two other team members who we slightly changed their roles in our company because we wanted to leverage their strengths. And they're now doing things that they're really energized about. Predictable success is a book I just read about helping to understand the life cycles of business um, and what you need to do to, to get to the next level and not go past that level. Um, the one thing I forgot to include was Simon Sinek. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Simon Sinek. Uh, I first saw a TED talk of his r brilliant insights and an effective communicator. Uh, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, uh, just a couple days ago, I was back on another one of his videos. He's great for providing business insight. Um, Self-reflection really helps leaders recalibrate. And I'm, I just listed the ones that I, that I think through my self-reflection are what's important to me. And the reason self-reflection is important, and not just as a leader, I say as a leader, but it's really helpful for everybody, it really uh, keeps you aligned with the vision and the mission. Now that may be your company's vision and mission, it may be your personal vision and mission, but every once in a while you just got to stop and self-reflect and say, what am I doing? Am I still doing what I want? Am I doing it the way I want? It keeps you grounded. I mean, you've, you've heard news about some leaders that just totally, owners of companies are just making stupid decisions. They just totally lost their way. You know, self-reflecting helps keep you grounded. And it keeps you aware in the moment. And there's nothing more important for leaders than to be self-aware and be a present in the moment. If you're not, you, you're going to look back and your team's not going to even be there with you because they're going to be going in a different direction. So it's important to do self-reflection. It's important to know your true north. For me, I was very fortunate. I believe I found my true north, my moral compass early. Um, you should, you know, you're at the point in your lives, I think it's the best thing to do is start your careers well. And the best way to start that is to know your true north. Remember, your first job's not going to be your last job but your true north is going to be with you for the rest of your life. So I would encourage you to stick, to identify your true north and stick to that. Um, for me, I, I look back and I realize my, my journey was not a straight line. You know, just because you have a true north doesn't mean it's going to go like that. Um, my life was not a straight line. There's, there was a lot of sideways because life disruptors that I just talked about pushed me out and I found my way back, or I stayed out there because it was an important place to be. Um, I also kept my eyes open. I never put blinders on. A lot of business people put their blinders on, and then it's too late. I use my business to make a difference, and not only for myself, but for others. And I think it's important for you to do the same thing, whether you own the business, lead the business, or part of a business. So for me, creative thinking, mission-focused, service-driven, that's our business but it's also my life. And one thing you'll learn when, you're, when you own a small business, there's not much distinct, when, distinction between your business and your life. There's a lot of interdependency. Uh, so my words of advice for you, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Please be principled in your thinking and doing. Regardless of what career path you take, regardless of whether you want to own a business, lead a business, or just be uh, a valuable part of a team in a business. Be principled in your thinking and doing. Remember that influence usually comes before the leadership title is even given. That's, that's something a lot of people don't realize. They wait for the title before they think they're going to lead. Well, influencing comes before leading. Um, and you really want to make sure that you don't wait. And if you're leading with principled things, even if they're not the easy decisions, but you believe they're the right decisions, the more you influence people, the more opportunities you have for leading. And if you choose the leadership track, again, be a leader that people want to follow. Because if there's nothing worse than a leader being way out there, you turn around and look back, they're not right behind you. You want to have um, 
if you're going to be a leader, you want to have the, the principal leadership and you're going to lead by examples that they want to follow. Uh, leadership takes grit and a long haul perspective. Good leadership is not about today, it's about the vision for the future and you, you have to be always looking way out and willing to take uh, some chances to get you there. Don't disrupt or don't ignore life's disruptors. They're going to be out there. Some are loud, some are quiet, but don't, don't ignore them. Uh, and realize your true north and use that as your compass and your platform. Um, this is a, a line from the 2007 movie Evan Almighty. I don't know if anybody saw that. I, this, this scene just really struck me. If someone prays for courage, do, do you think God gives them courage or opportunities to be courageous? And again, for me, it's about faith. Take faith out of it if you want. There are going to be life disruptions. There are going to be opportunities that may not look that way at first. But you've got to keep your eyes and ears open. You have to hear them. You have to un try to understand them. And they may not be exactly what you expect them to be, but that doesn't mean you should ignore them. You, know, you may want something. They're not going to give it to you. You've got to figure out what to do with it. You may want a leadership title. You may not get that leadership title, but you have opportunities to influence people within your company or your organization that you may be a greater leader than the leader who has the leadership title. This line has just really struck with me. Finally, um, as I said, don't, don't uh, ignore life's disruptions. This is our, our grandson, Jeremiah. Um, and as I told you, I think my next opportunity for great, doing great things may not be with our business, it may be with our grandson, it may be with uh, autism, but you're going to have those opportunities in your life, um, and I would really encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you very much. I, didn't, I should have said to ask questions if you have questions. I apologize uh, that I didn't do that, but does anybody have any questions or comments that you'd like to ask? Hopefully you didn't mind my uh, walking you through my timeline, and hopefully you got one or two things out of there that you might be able to apply in your lives. Thank you very much.